We're going to be in Acts chapter 19 this morning. The title of the message is simple. It's just the intro to 1 Timothy. But we want to look at Acts 19 this morning, where it's, it's really Paul's impact at the beginning there on the church in Ephesus. <clears throat> If you don't have a Bible, you can raise your hand, and we'd love to put one in your hand this morning. Very important. I forgot to pray uh, it was going to be part of communion. That's why I did first service. So don't let me close out this message without praying for uh, the victims there in, uh, in Texas and Louisiana for Hurricane Harvey. So here we are. You're in Acts 19. But before that, I want to just kind of set some... And that's what this morning's all about, setting some, kind of the scene for 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, kind of understanding what was taking place, what the city was like, what was Paul's impact on the city at the very beginning, and, and, and let's talk about the character and person of Timothy. But, and and uh, so this morning, let's just start by, by looking uh, at the city of Ephesus. Ephesus was the cent- <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> Ephesus was the capital and chief city of the Roman province of Asia, right on the sea coast. Ephesus was a real wealthy city, you know, one that the Romans were really proud of. But with that, it also came a, a lot of poverty. It was kind of a split town, much like a big metro- metropolis town uh, today. You, you go down to the beach, and there's, you know, you've got somebody driving, a, you know, a really expensive car, and you've got homeless. It's It's just like two extremes, down like, say, in Santa Monica. But like the large, prosperous cities, Ephesus had its share of idols and pagan worship. Among many different forms of pagan worship, listen, was the worship of the goddess Diana, also called Artemis. The temple was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, her temple was. She was considered the mother goddess of the earth. What amazes me is still there are people today that that worship a God like this. The Ephesians were considered the temple guardians of the goddess Diana, who they believe whose image fell from to earth from Zeus. And we know that from Acts 19, 35. In fact, the whole upper part of her body was covered with rows of breasts to signify that she was the mother of all life. Her most famous statue stood on a platform at the entrance to her temple. As the statues would indicate, she impersonated the reproductive powers of men and of animals, as well as all other life. There were priests in this temple. There was a chief priest, or a high priest, and under him, were priests that were appointed by the city elders. The city was heavily involved. Like I said, they were considered the city of Ephesus, and and the residents of Ephesus were considered to be the guardians of this temple. So they took great responsibility and pride. And so it was the city elders that, in in the second class of priests, they would appoint these second class of priests for a one year period of time. But there was a third class of priests that would offer sacrifices and and do those sacrificial duties there in the temple. But none were as 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 important as the priestess that were around the temple in great number. Their focus and duties were on ceremonial prostitution as worship. There was a huge number And so, you see, the culture was all wrapped up in this god of Diana. There were different shrines of Diana sold. Some silver and even gold. We know Demetrius was a silversmith and made his profits and made great profits off of carving sculptures out of silver. But they would be out of gold, silver, and mostly those that were found in in, in ancient Ephesus today that are being dug up are mostly those made out of clay. There was not only many types of shrines made out of all kinds of different materials, 
But there were many different people making these and making great profit off these little trinkets. You know, that's just one sign of religion. There's always a trinket to go with it. Much like Catholicism and and other forms of religion, there's a statue that you worship. We know Demetrius, he made great profit out of Acts 19.24, but he was also great trouble, we'll look at this morning, to Paul and his team as they preached the gospel, mostly because they got into his pocket financially. There's a museum today that has several of the original, dug up original statutes of the, of the, of the temple Diana, but, but they weren't the ones around the temple. They were ones that came from other parts of town that weren't so destroyed. They're in a museum today, they're, and they're whole, believe it or not. Interestingly, not saying to believe this, but I read that many believe that Mary, the mother of Jesus, spent the last three years of her life in Ephesus. Don't know how true that is. And also, Cleopatra spent much of her life in Ephesus. This was a high role in town, mostly due to the pagan worship. Let's talk a little bit about Timothy, the one that Paul would write to here in 1 Timothy Timothy's name literally means one who honors God. He got his name from his mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois. They were devout Jews and became believers in Jesus Christ. They had taught Timothy the scriptures from childhood. Just like the old scriptures say, raise up a child in the way they should go, right? They, his grandmother, mother and grandmother did that. And then by doing so, they laid this powerful foundation for Timothy this added this this really was his foundation for being a godly man. We know Timothy's father was a Greek and for that reason we know that Timothy was not circumcised as a Jew or at least until Paul got a hold of him. <laughs> Most likely Timothy's father had died before Paul came on the scene. The city Timothy was from and where Paul had first met the young man was in Lystra, the Roman province of Galatia, which is still a part of Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, not far from Ephesus. It happened as Paul was traveling on his first missionary journey that he met the young Timothy in Acts 14, 6 through 23, and no doubt he saw something special both in him and his grandmother and mother. But Remember, Lystra is the same city that Paul was dragged out of and stoned and left for dead. Believed that God had raised him from the dead. I firmly believe, and he, what's amazing is he went back into that city and finished preaching the gospel. What a, what a first century cowboy Paul was. <laughs> he was a gunslinger, but the guns he was slinging was the gospel. I dig it. But it was on Paul's second missionary journey in Acts 16 that he asked Timothy to be his companion, his traveling partner, and co-worker, co-labor in the faith. Even though Timothy was very young, listen, possibly as young as 18 or 19 years old when Paul picked him up on his second missionary journey in Lystra. Remember, we'll read in 1 Timothy 4.12, that Paul will tell him, look, don't let anybody despise your youth as being a young pastor and leader in this church. He makes that statement in 1 Timothy 4.12, 15 years after picking Timothy up in Lystra on his second missionary journey. That would have made Timothy, this young pastor that he's writing to in 1 Timothy, about 33 to 35 years old. That's, that's amazing. I was not prepared to be a pastor at 33 years old. a young pastor, to be put in such a critical position at such a critical time and in such a critical place. But make no mistake, Timothy was the man for the job and Paul knew it. 
He had a solid reputation of being godly, making godly decisions. And I believe that Timothy's strength was his faithfulness. Now, many, because of a few verses, see Timothy and throw him under the bus for being timid. Not a fighter, kind of a soft-spoken young man. Maybe so. But you don't know something? His faithfulness outweighed his lack of maybe, you know, grit, if you would. After all, it was Timothy and Luke that really stood by Paul's side, regardless of what was happening. He was his, truly his, his trustworthy companion. Timothy was Paul's disciple. He was his co-labor friend and even considered son in the faith. Timothy was serving with Paul in places like Berea, Athens, Corinth, and even Jerusalem. Timothy was with Paul during his first Roman imprisonment. And he visited many of the churches that they had planted, keeping Paul informed of what was going on in those churches. But interestingly enough, in Hebrews 13, 23, we learn that Timothy found himself at one point in prison for preaching the gospel. Where? When? We don't exactly know. It's not recorded in Acts or in anywhere else other than just being mentioned in Hebrews 13, 23. But he found his way out by trusting God. But here... Paul has left the young pastor Timothy in Ephesus to look after things and to establish the church, to set it in order, if you would, as well as dealing with false doctrine and false teaching. But what about Paul? Paul, the apostle to Ephesus. It was again in his second missionary journey, leaving Corinth, that he sailed to the seacoast city of Ephesus. According to Acts 18.18, 18, Paul had spent a good many days there in Ephesus, leaving behind his friends Aquila and Priscilla, and a strong church was established. That's when he left after his first time being there. Acts 19 is his second time he shows up and second missionary journey. So when did, write, so when did Paul write the three pastoral epistles? First Timothy, Second Timothy, and Titus. Well, first, I want to bring up this. I made a big deal about 1st and 2nd Thessalonians being Paul's very first epistles that he wrote. Not only that, but how he'd done amazing things in just a few weeks. But 1st and 2nd Timothy is just a complete opposite. He has spent over, you will find that he'll spend over two years this second time through in Ephesus. And not only that, but 1st and 2nd Timothy are his last books that he would write. Specifically 2 Timothy. But it's important to understand when trying to pinpoint when he wrote this book that there's nothing recorded in the book of Acts regarding Paul leaving Timothy in Ephesus. This all took place after that. The book of Acts closes out, remember, with Paul's rather comfortable incarceration in Rome, awaiting his appeal to Caesar. Remember, this first time in Rome when he's in prison, it's really not like he's chained to a stone wall in a dungeon someplace, but he's actually in a rented house of his own, right? Yes, he's under house arrest, is more like it. He's just not free to come and go, but people are able to come, and he's able to minister to people, and, and people like Timothy and Luke are able to be there and visit with them, and he's able to send them out and check on these other churches. So Paul was able to do ministry as he was awaiting to appeal before Caesar. Therefore, the thought of most, of most is that Paul was released and able to continue his missionary work for a few more years. And it was during that time that Paul sent Timothy, or left Timothy, in Ephesus to lead this important church for a time. This first letter is believed to be written from Philippi around AD 63 by Paul himself. Paul will instruct again this young protege, pastor, in church structure, in church order, and priority of teaching the word and truth. 
He will instruct Timothy on how to deal with false truth teaching, not to mention equipping and raising up leaders in the church that would carry on the work of the ministry, as he says in Ephesians. So let's go to Acts chapter 19. Well, you're already there. It's a long read. I did it on first service, but you know what? It's important because you get the picture of Paul and, and really the impact that he had on the city of Ephesus and why this city was so important. Acts 19, verse 1. And it happened while Apollos was in Corinth and Paul, having passed through the upper region, came to Ephesus and found some disciples. He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And so they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, into what then are you baptized? So they said, well, into John's baptism. And then Paul said, well, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, epied them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about 12, such a small number. God did amazing things with 12 men at one other time, did he? And he went into the synagogue, Paul did, and he spoke boldly for three months now, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and didn't believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Powerful. Powerful. Now, God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and the disease left them and the evil spirits went out from them. Then some of the <clears throat> inerrant Jews, Jewish exorcists, took it upon themselves to call on the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, right? We exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. I think that's a big mistake. Also, there were seven sons of Siva, a Jewish priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? And then the, name, <clears throat> and then the man in whom the evil spirit was, leaped on them, overpowered them, prevailed against them, so they fled out of that house naked and wounded. But what was the outcome? This became known both to all the Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified, magnified over the name Diana, Diana, at least for a little bit. And many who had believed, came confessing and telling their deeds. So many of those, also many of those who had practiced magic, brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all men. And they continued, or excuse me, and they counted the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mighty, mightily and prevailed. And when these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the spirit, when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must go also and see Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus. Thank you. Need a drink of water. But <clears throat> he himself stayed in Asia for a time. And about the time there arose a great commotion about the way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith who had made silver shrines of Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. He called them together with the <clears throat> and he called them together with the workers of similar occupation and said, Men, you know 
that we have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see in here that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. So not only this trade of ours is in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. Now, when they heard this, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. So the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius and Articus, Macedonians, Paul's traveling companions. And when Paul wanted to go into the people, the disciples would not allow him. And then some of the officials of Asia, there's those elders of the city, who were his friends, sent to him pleading that he would not venture into the theater. So therefore, some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused, and most of them did not know why they had even come together. Right? Nothing like a riot. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, and the Jews putting him forward, and Alexander motioned with his hand and wanted to make his defense to the people. But when they had found out that he was a Jew, all with one voice cried out for about two hours, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And when the city clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Look, men of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know that the city of Ephesus that the city of the Ephesians is temple guardian of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Zeus. Therefore, since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing harshly, for you have been brought for you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of your goddess. Therefore, if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a case against anyone, the courts are open and there are pro councils. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you have any other inquiry to make, it shall be determined in the lawful assembly. For we are in danger of being called into question for today's uproar. There being no reason which we may give to account for this disorderly gathering. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. It broke up. Wow. Here Paul shows up, and God begins to really move in a powerful way. And it's important to see how he moved. And how and by what means this church was established. Now first, he shows up, and he meets some guys, and he begins to preach the gospel to them. He finds out that they're believers they're disciples, but they've only trusted in John's baptism. Obviously, they've repented of their sins, but they don't know anything about Jesus, nor about the filling of the Holy Spirit. It's important to understand that they believed on Jesus and were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ before Paul laid hands on them, right? And they received the Holy Spirit. It doesn't happen any other way, okay? They received the Lord Jesus Christ. They became believers in Jesus, and then the Spirit of God fell upon them. So we see here that these 12 men really kind of became Paul's disciples in leading this church. It's pretty simple. Such a small group, again, reminds me of Jesus and his 12 disciples. And so Paul, he goes in for three months into the synagogue. It says here that he's, he's you know, rationally and boldly speaking. It's, it's like he's seriously preaching is what the passage is in the simplest form is saying. With boldness, he's reasoning. You could, you could say that he's arguing in a healthy way, not in an unhealthy way. He's arguing the truth of the gospel by preaching out of the Old Testament, which was Paul's main thing. And so here... What happens is, obviously, like in every other city, there's some division that takes place. Division between the Jews. Some believe and some aren't. Well, the ones that don't take serious offense because they see the gospel as coming against Judaism, not really fulfilling all the prophets 
that Paul obviously was sharing with them. Well, they cause up a stir and they run him out of the synagogue. And right around the corner, a stone's throw away, Tyrannus, one of the converts, right? This is like a study hall is what he had. He led a study hall, not a, not a faith-based study hall, just a secular study hall. And, and right around the corner, he moved. Tyrannus says, I'll tell you what, you can use the study hall between 11 and 4. You see, between 11 and 4 in that culture, still even today, that's when they would take their break. It's the hottest times of the day. And so at 11, you would stop and cease from work and break and go 11 through 4, eat your biggest meal of the day, right? Rest up, spend some time hanging out, maybe go back to the house, take care of un things you need to take care of, and then you come back and work for a few more hours. So Paul, who was working himself with his own hands in Ephesus, would take his own break. And for over two years, he's in this school preaching the word of God in this study hall. Powerful, powerful what takes place. And obviously, many are coming to faith. Lives are being transformed in a powerful, powerful way. So, to, so much powerful that, I mean, signs begin to happen. I mean, like serious, hardcore, in-your-face miracles. People begin to be prayed for and begin to receive healing. Now, how are people healed? Now, we know we, there's the gift of healing, but I, I'm telling you, I don't believe anyone, anyone possesses the gift of healing on a constant 24-hour basis, seven days a week, 52 right, weeks of the year. It doesn't happen. By faith, we pray. But many times, it's the faith of the one that's being prayed for that activates that healing. And it's just proof that lives are being radically changed and that they're trusting in God in big ways when not only are people being prayed for and healed, but they're being prayed for and healed by just a garment, by a handkerchief or an apron of the Apostle Paul. That's, that's, just, that's just amazing. Amazing. I don't, I don't lift Paul up. I lift God up. I glorify God for that. And then I look and go, wow, they had some crazy, crazy faith. Those who were trusting in Jesus in Ephesus. Think about what they're coming out of. Pagan worship. I mean, and it's like 10th degree. Here you see this guy being healed and evil spirits being lifted from him. And you're thinking, and two weeks ago, I saw him down here at the Temple Diana. And he was hooked up with one of those prostitutes you know, priestess, you know, uh, you, now, now he's just transformed. This is crazy stuff taking place. And then you, th then all of a sudden, what happens? The counterfeit. Now, this is the first sign of the enemy showing up. There's always a counterfeit. And here, we see here these Jewish chief priests and the seven sons of Siva, right? They try to duplicate what, what God's doing. Big mistake, you can't duplicate what God's doing if you don't know God. And they pay the price. They get whooped up on by an evil spirit. <laughs> you know, nothing's worse than coming home from school and telling Dad, I got beat up today. But, but man, coming home and saying, I got beat up by an evil spirit, it's like, you know, it's like, you did what? <laughs> you know whose son you are, boy? You know, it's like, Okay, I digressed. And so, here we are. And many who had believed came, listen, 18, confessing and telling their deeds. That's where it comes down. What, this is our problem, folks. We take our sin and we don't, we, don't, we, we don't confess it and we don't burn it. We'll read on. Instead, we kind of put it over here in the closet so we can play with it later. You know what I'm saying? And we get wonder why we keep falling back into the same old sin. You're not confessing it, and you're not bringing it out in the open public and lighting it on fire. That's what they did with all their books of, of pagan worship, of magic. I mean, this was, this was I mean, 
and Satan's just blowing up right now. You can just see Satan just, right? He's on fire because these guys are radically getting changed. There's crazy junk happening in Ephesus. They're bringing their books. They're bringing all, and they're burning it. And look at the total of it was 50,000 pieces of silver. This was no small thing. What happened if we would take all the stuff that we'd worked so hard for, and even the things we placed all of our trust in for so many years, and lit it on fire? Not just put it away, light it on fire. Utterly destroy the sin. You, you, you just, look, you can't take the things that God has forgiven you of and cleansed you of, convicted you of, the things you're turning over to God and leaving at the foot of the cross and then just put it back over here. That's, that's, that's Saul, the first king of Israel, made that problem. He said, no, you utterly destroy the Amalekite, the sin in your life. Don't play with it. No, kill it all. Because if you don't, it's going to come right back alive. It's going to eat you alive. And these guys, what a, what a great, magnificent example of faith and trust. And so the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. It's one thing for God's word to grow. Man, don't you want to see it prevail? That means, don't you want to see that victory? Oh, man, victory. Victory is what I want to see. I want to see wins. I want to see the wind column lining up. Not losses. But wins. But the enemy shows up. There's a riot. There's a riot. For a certain man, verse 24, named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Diana, brought no small profit to this craftsman. You know where his trust and faith was in, wasn't it? Isn't it? It's, it's in his money. It's in his skill. It's all in his trade. Us men don't have problems with that at all, do we? He called them together, this guy. He calls all those who are in similar op occupations, those that are making these images, these carven things, and making great profit. Of course they're going to be on his side. He's the ringleader. He persuades them and turns them away and all the people away by saying at the bottom of 26 Paul is saying they are not gods which are made with hands what a foolish statement what a foolish statement that he makes I mean that's a statement that you'd expect like to come out of a first grader like it's such a first grade level statement well, what do you mean the thing that I just made is not a god <laughs> I want you to think about that thought for just a minute. If I can make it, then I'm really its God. Okay? It's not my God. I'm its God. That's the beautiful thing about creation. We stand before God. He's creator God. I'm not higher than him. I didn't make God. When he says, your ways are not my ways, your thoughts are not my thoughts, you know, they're higher it's because we didn't carve him with our own hands. But rather, he did us with his hands. That's a big problem with pagan worship. It always goes that way. And don't think for a minute it's not, it, it's non-existent in our world today. Because it is existent in our world today. We've just made it look more appealing. And we've accepted it in different ways. But again, at the bottom of 27, he is clarifying that this magnificent, magnificent Diana, right, that's lifted up in their eyes, is worshipped in Asia and in, and in the world. No doubt. No doubt. This was a big, big battle. And so, verse 29, the whole city was filled with confusion over this. Demetrius and his partners, 
they cause us confusion. Right? They grab up and they seize a couple of Paul's companions, Gaius and Articus. Gaius and Articus. This finds itself being led into the theater. Guys, this theater is, is still there today. You can go to Ephesus today, and, and if we went today and we went a year from now, it's changing so radically. They're constantly, archaeologically, they're just constantly digging up this city, and they're finding more and more artifacts that are just totally biblically true. And, they're, and, and so this the whole theater is exposed, although much of it exists, but not all of it. But even today, if you stand in this theater, right, its acoustics are magnificent. Imagine, 25,000 people and no sound system. And can you imagine what this crowd sounded like in trying to get their attention? They led it there for a reason. Everybody wants to be heard. When you've got a beef, you want to make it known. Just like false news. Here, they drag them right to the theater. And the officials get involved. It turns into a confusing time to where they don't even know why they're there. And the city clerk steps in, trying to quiet him down. What's amazing here is the reason why he stepped in was for the same reason why Pontius Pilate was trying to calm the crowd. Rome did not dig these kind of outbursts. They, they, they weren't like this. They, they ruled with an iron fist. And so the city officials stepped in because, man, if this gets out of hand and gets back to Rome, we're going to pay, just like Pontius Pilate. He was trying to keep the crowd down, just trying to appease the crowd that day Jesus was falsely accused and crucified. What's on trial here? What's on trial? It's important to understand what's on trial. Their faith. The gospel's on trial. And the next time that we get into it, I want you to remember what's on trial. The gospel's on trial. Your faith is on trial. That's what's being called on right here. Amen. 37, for you have brought these men who are neither robbers, he says, of temples, nor blasphemers of Diana. He's pulling, I don't find any fault in these guys necessarily. Therefore, he's talking about Demetrius and his henchmen. If they have a case, let them bring it to the courts. He's trying to bring this to an end and take a civil approach to the issue. This became a disorderly gathering. After this, Paul would leave town. Two years, God moves. God does powerful things. And now, next week, we're going to go into 1 Timothy. And, and this church is established. But the enemy has not let up on this powerful church and won't let up on this powerful church. Before we go into it, I want you guys to understand something. We are, you and I, we're the church, and we want God to move in our lives. We want to be governed by God. And if that happens, the enemy is going to strike a blow every single time. When people's lives begin to be set free from bondage, from the chains of this world, every time the enemy's going to show up. I hate to say this, but I, I've been pastoring long enough to know this. Somebody's going to fall away when it gets hard. Somebody's going to drop the ball. How about those that have just been baptized? You just made a public profession, although, granted, 
you did it so in, in front of almost everybody was a Christian. But you want to know something? Almost every time that I baptize a group of people, there's a percentage that immediately fall under hardcore difficulties, persecution, a trial, a struggle, a spiritual challenge of some kind. Look, when God moves, it's going to happen with difficulty. Do you know that? It's important that we know that. Setting into this. So it doesn't surprise us when we open the pages of 1 Timothy and realize that he's trying to establish leaders in the church. And I'm like thinking, there's not leaders in the church. He's trying to, to weed out false doctrine and false teachers. How did they get in there? As I opened in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we're, we're all running a race. The race that the Lord has set before you. Not a race of the flesh, but a spiritual one. One that we're, we're taking seriously. There's a prize. There is a prize. You know, I, when you ask somebody that competes in anything, seriously. Most will tell you, I, I, when it comes right down to it, I don't do this for the money. I don't do this for the trophy. I don't even do it for the fame or the glory. It's just, it's just what I do. And there's this drive in them to want to finish well. And I think that we need that as Christians, as people of God. There needs to be a desire to want to finish out well and not to be moved or swayed by this but when you see this attack happening you actually go pay, praise God things are happening see that's what Paul and Silas did praise God look at God moving because the truth it's, the truth is divisive it is. Sadly, it is. We don't like to think of it that way. But absolute truth is divisive. It will always be divisive. You'll have those that follow it and those that refute it. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you so much for your work and your purposes and plans for us. Lord, Thank you for these folks. Fill this church with your spirit. Lord, we take off and follow hard after you. We want you. We want you. Lord, we stop right now and want to pray in closing for those victims in Texas and Louisiana along the coast that have been hit by this hurricane, Harvey. Lord, this is not your judgment but what this is and this is the this is the earth and those those birth pains as it will as you say in your word these storms this is just a sign of the times things are beginning to shake father we pray right now for those families that have lost there's been nearly a right at 50 people that have lost their lives and Father, we pray for those families that have lost loved ones. We ask, Lord God, that you would bring people into their life that would share you, the gospel and with truth and hope with them. Lord God, we pray, God, for your provision and your supply. Lord, I thank you that even Israel has sent helpers to Texas. Will we help Israel when their world falls apart? Lord, we pray, God, that the workers would be many. Lord, the church never looks more beautiful than in a, in a disaster like this, like Katrina and like here, because we lay aside all our, our petty differences 
and we take up the cross and we begin to serve and we begin to love and we begin to help in your strength and power. Lord, that, that it's like beauty from ashes. And Lord, we pray that. In faith, we pray that now. And Lord, we pray that you would open up the doors for this small church to do our small part in helping. That we would just be just one splinter of what you're doing. I want to pray a blessing, Lord, over our church. A spiritual blessing. Not a temporal, financial, here today, gone tomorrow. But God, a deep spiritual growth over the people in Maricopa. God, I pray that the gospel would go out with power and authority and would yield much fruit. Lord, help us not to be moved when the enemy shows up. For that just means you're working all the more. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.